secret strip shows and sacred prostitution. A&E investigates the children of God. When I was still in the cult, I watched several documentaries exposing some of the things. And I was sitting in my living room and they were showing it to us to kind of prepare us for what was coming out against us. And there on the screen, there's me as a child dancing in a semi-state of undress. And it took me a few seconds to catch my breath. It all kind of brought me to a realization that I had been really abused as a child. I had no idea. It was the sexualization of children was so rampant within this group. We were being groomed by a master pedophile, David Berg. One day, Amy comes up to me and she says, oh, see that guy there? He molested me when I was 11 years old. He used scripture and he used spiritual principles to excuse his behavior. Please come into my heart. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. Please forgive me of my sins. There is an epidemic. We've lost a lot of people to suicide. The suicide rate with ex-members is so high. How many do you think? I know 100. We've gone to the FBI, we've given them our affidavits, and they keep telling us their hands are tied. This organization, are they sorry for what they did? Do they have any remorse? I don't think so. People literally are losing their lives and their, their hopes and dreams and their families over this. we've come, you know, since I was here last. I'm planning an event this weekend for my friend who was in the cult. She's not with us anymore. You can't be close to a fire and not get burned, you know? I think people are quick to pass judgment on survivors and victims. But this is a very complex and detailed story. This is a serious matter. These are people's lives at stake. When my dad was 14 years old, he met Berg and his family right before they started the Children of God. This was on Huntington Beach. They were just starting to create a Jesus movement. And my dad was a very talented singer, and he fell right in line with what they were trying to put together. Have a good time the Lord. We'll have a good time. Which was a talented group of young people that could inspire other young people to evangelize and sort of rally some hippies and people that were like runaways and people looking for a better life. They were kind of high on Jesus. And in the beginning, it seemed to be pretty fun. The late 1960s was a period of cultural turmoil, especially for American youth and indeed youth throughout the Western world. David Berg was able to use the language and the symbols of the counterculture to present his own attitudes about Christianity. That movement portrayed Jesus as the ultimate revolutionary. They used music a lot in their lifestyle and in their evangelism. They had several bands. One of the more popular ones in France was called Les Enfants de Dieu, which is also the children of God. And they produced an album that was a top seller at the time called The Bible. And I said, come and follow, come and follow me, call it all, come and follow me. In 
Most of Berg's teachings were communicated to the cult through his writings. They were coined mole letters. Berg would just go on for hours and hours talking about orders, about policies, and interpretation of scripture, because he sort of fancied himself as a pastor, king, prophet, enforcer, all of the above. The concept of flirty fishing started in the late 70s, where they would use specifically female but also male sex appeal to proselytize and to get supporters from the outside world. He taught it as God has given you this body and this ability to make men happy because he wants you to use it. He wants you to use your talents, and your talent is sexuality, to bring in big fish or kings to donate to the group. And it worked. Berg was constantly coming out with new revelations. And one of his revelations that came out right around the time of flirty fishing was called the law of love. We no longer under the laws of Moses. We're no longer under the Ten Commandments. Just this one law of love fulfills all ten and all the rest put together. Berg believed he had boiled down the essential Christian scripture to one doctrine, and that was the law of love. The law of love was uh, to encompass everything else that Christianity taught, and as long as people acted in the context of love, he was able to justify and sanctify their behaviors, including sexual behaviors. I practice what I preach, and I preach sex, boys and girls, hallelujah! Berg very cleverly manipulated those that he drew into his inner circle to believe that he was truly a prophet and a visionary that was going to liberate all of us from the shackles of society. But actually, we were a liberated Christian sex cult. Make your body my temple and I'll come in. This is the temple of God today. What is striking to me is how open David Berg was about his most controversial preachings, which were basically sex is love and should be spread to everyone. And there's nothing wrong with sex as long as it's done lovingly. If, if you think of our generation, which we were born into it, anything that you're told when you're born into something, if, it, if that's what the culture is telling you is OK, you pretty much accept it as, well, the adults know best, you know, it must be okay, or that's what God wants us to do. So for the second generation, of course, we had questions. You did. That was also, they had, they had safeguards in place for that as well. What um, kind? If you doubt the leader, you're going to be ostracized, you're going to be punished. There were, there was a lot of, I guess you'd say peer pressure mm -hmm. in the society within the cult right. to basically go along and follow whatever was being told by Berg. Both of my parents were teenagers when they had me, and I was one of the first children born into the cult. When I was about eight years old, I was living in France and I was invited with my parents to a recording music unit in Greece that Berg was overseeing. He wasn't there, but he would oversee it. And we were creating this show that was broadcast in several countries. What's wrong with kissing? Hugging, hugging. What's wrong with love? Don't try to figure it out. We couldn't live without love. So I went back to France with my parents after the visit, and then we got a letter from Berg asking my parents if they could let me go back to the music unit, but without them. They just wanted me. From then on out, I was called into the studio almost on a daily basis to do recordings. But as soon as I got away from my parents, this is when I started being introduced to the sexuality aspect of the cult. We literally were 
just surrounded by sexuality at that point. And children suffer the most, I think, because the law of love crossed the, the barrier between adults and children, and there were no safety nets put in place for the children. There were a lot of inappropriate sexual advances that we had to endure as young as eight years old. Me personally, and all of the young women my age that I knew, all of them. When I was still at this music unit, Berg sent out a letter called Glorify God in the Dance. And we read it, and all the women were going to do these dances for Berg's birthday. And he made a very detailed explanation of what they should do and how it's glorifying God if you disrobe in a very, I guess you'd say, gracious manner. And that's how he presented it, as you're like a heavenly woman who's dancing with veils. So women started making videos for him at his behest. And then someone got the bright idea that, let's include the children. The video crew would set up in a setting and put on two or three pieces of music and have you start off with your, you know, your veil on, and then you slowly start playing around with your veil as you dance nude. And we didn't really understand the sexual aspect of it. We were already performing and singing. It didn't seem to be a, a stretch. It was just like a slow introduction to sexuality, which was like being groomed is exactly what was happening. We were being essentially groomed by a master pedophile, David Berg. I was introduced to a lot of sexual situations that children just aren't introduced to. A lot of nudity, a lot of dancing, and it was open season. Anybody could approach you and... Touch you? Uh, there, yeah, and you couldn't... They didn't teach you to say no, is what it was. There was no such thing as no. So you could kind of get away from it if you, if you could, if you could outsmart whoever was coming after you. But essentially, when a leader did, it was almost like you were afraid of what would happen if you didn't comply. All those arrangements are to inhibit, prohibit emotional bonds forming between individuals, emotional connections between parents and children. So there's, a, there's a reason parents. for the madness. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. These patterns occur again and again in group after group. And the closer you got to the top or to the leadership apex, um, the more you were disconnected from your family and from society. And the most isolated I ever was was at Berg's household. When I was about 13 years old, they told me Berg's calling you to join his household in the Philippines. And in a way, I felt like I was the chosen, you know, because that's how they made me feel, like, well, you've been chosen. When I first met Berg, I was expecting the earth to shake and something like I was going to have this experience from meeting the prophet. But actually, I just kind of thought he looked really old and really fat. And I thought, this is just a human being. And but then I noticed everyone around him would basically kiss his, you know, behind all the time. Everything he said was written down. His wife, Karen Zerby was like walking around behind him, you know, recording everything he said. He was uh, basically being enabled by the team around him. He would call different women up to his room where each of the women in the household would spend time with him. And this was on a rotating basis. One day I was called into his room and he said, well, you're now gonna become one of my wives and we're gonna get married. I'm only 13, this is like not, this is crazy, like it just came out of nowhere and there was no, do you want to, do you not want to? No, we're getting married. So he puts a ring on my finger. It was almost like from here on out, you belong to me and whatever you do from here on out, you are mine and you answer to me. And after that, we had, you know, intimacy. I 
I don't think that I was always the most docile and receptive teenager. So that's how I got sent away. But I was very sad that I left Mary. Mary Berg, David Berg's granddaughter, then and now. They put this silver ring on my hand, and they, he said, I now wed thee, you know, I, David, now wed thee. I was supposed to be now one of his wives, and I was his grand grandchild. He also wanted to have sexual relations with me. Mary was also one of the children that was asked to come and join the music unit. And that's where Mary and I became sisters, because they put us in the same family. We roomed together. We did everything together. We went through a lot of the same experiences together. And we traveled to several countries, all the way up to the time that we ended up both going to Berg's household in the Philippines. And what ended up happening to her should never have happened to her. She went completely crazy, you know, from the abuse. And she did end up having a mental breakdown, and the way that the breakdown was handled was just horrible. They thought her emotional reactions to what was happening to her was demonic possession you know, sent away to this training camp where she was treated very inhumanely. To hear about all the, the horrible things that happened to her, the beatings and her being basically tied up, it was a terrible thing. Feeling helpless and feeling powerless to help people that you love is probably the worst thing that I experienced. It just showed me how horrible, you know, they could, they could turn on someone that sweet, you know, and that vul vulnerable. And um, there were no limits to how far they would go with their abuse. I look the same? Okay. <laughs> the same. I guess I'll take it that as a compliment. I think I would recognize you anywhere. Yeah. How are you doing? Pretty good. How was your flight? Good. Is it good? Yeah. I'm so glad you got to come. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I did not know Mary Berg personally. It was only the image that we had of her growing up as children and then her story afterwards. But we knew about her because she would come out in videos and she would sing. Good times, bad times, happy times, glad times. All the world over. Good times, bad times. It was like, wow, you know, there's, she's singing. She lives with David Burke. She's his granddaughter. So she was put on a pedestal of, uh, of a celebrity status. When she got out, uh, she got involved in a court case, and she willingly gave her testimony about living with David Berg and living through these abuses. Mary says confessing her doubts to family members brought on the wrath of the man she called Grandpa. He started yelling real loud in tongues and, 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 and took a hold of my head and started shaking it real hard. And, and I thought, you know, this is it. I mean, I have reached the end of the line. This is the bottom. Later on, we heard about how difficult her life became as an adult. 
she was at the lowest low, living on the streets, you know, addicted, uh, without anything, on the brink of dying so many times, but she came back from that. And that's when she became, to a lot of us second generation members, a hero. You know, with Mary passing, even though it wasn't a right. suicide, I think the early death um, had something to do with her PTSD and the condition that led her into drug and alcohol abuse for many years. And um, it's all related. The suicide rate with ex-members is so high. And it's sadly, it's expected. When one of our fellow friends passes away, we immediately assume suicide because it makes sense. This organization, are they sorry for what they did? Do they feel that they have anything to be sorry for? Do they have any remorse? I don't think so because they haven't done anything to really help people that need it, that have left. People literally are losing their lives and their, their hopes and dreams and their families over this. Tell me about Mary. Mary did not commit suicide. No, but she did many, not. many other members and former members of Children of yes. God uh, have. How many do you think? I know 100 by name or by face that have committed suicide. You know 100 former members yes. who have committed suicide? I know of them, yes. That's a lot. And I would put into that category the slow death of addiction. And by the way, so many people suffering from addiction is, are trying to numb of, some sort of trauma it, it or is PTSD. It's a form of suicide. It's not officially that, but it's, uh, it's related. When I was in my mid-twenties, um, I, I got the news that my, my father had committed suicide. He was one of those very sensitive artists, wonderful musician. People still remember his music. He was a true believer. But he was shunned for disagreeing with leadership. I think it devastated him because he felt rejected. He felt like his family had rejected him. At the end of his life, he started realizing all the things that had happened to him. You know, he, he just, he couldn't handle it. You know, the, the world was too, it was too much for him to do it alone. Like he needed more help, but he didn't get it. So he, he's a casualty. He's a casualty of what the cult does to people. Hey, Amy. Hey. How you doing? So good to see you again. How are you doing? Oh my gosh. Oh. Hi. Hi, Ron. Mm, looking good. Oh, so glad to good see you. Good For quite some time, I wasn't happy with the cult. I was very, very dissatisfied with the way that life was going, but I didn't really see a practical way out at that point. But then my dad passed away and I went to Germany to the funeral. And at, at the funeral, I was able to reconnect with this couple, Annika and Ron, who had maintained a friendship with my dad. So when I met them at the funeral, they told me that if I ever wanted a way out and if I ever wanted to leave, that they would help me as much as they could and they would provide a place for me to land. And that's when I really started thinking, this is it. I'm out of here. Mary came to us a lot to uh, just for somebody to listen to her. You know, going through leaving the group, 
and then trying to find herself and all the experiences that she went through, from her highs to her lows. And I think that at the end of her life, she was definitely at a high. Yes. You know, being on the witness stand was a huge battle, but being able to fight your own demons yeah. and come out on the other side to find peace, even at the, just the last years of your life, that was such a feat. Yeah. And not only that, but if she did it, then anyone who leaves, yeah. no matter what your story, there's hope for you. Yes. Yeah. So my question is, how did you uh, get your name out there so people knew that they could it, it, come to oh, you? We were, first of all, we were written about in letters. We were enemies. Uh, enemies of the group. Yeah, they were, they were the, the And so the probably the bad publicity <laughs> about it is let people know. Right. And they, they knew that every person we came across that was in the group that we would offer, if you want to leave, that's the first thing we said to you, if you ever want to leave, we'll help you. This is what caused us to leave. Leadership came up to him and said, there's a 12-year-old girl that's being haughty and lifted up. We want you to have sex with her, to humble her. And he looked at that leader, and Ron doesn't cuss. He still doesn't cuss to this day. He looked at that leader, and he said, you want me to have sex with a child? You go yourself. And he said, and if I hear of anyone having sex with her, he says, you're going to answer to me. And he came to the room that night and just said, this is, we can't, we can't stay here. You literally have, have to face that. I made a mistake. And uh, this isn't going to be this group that I'm going to be in until the day I die. You had to say, no, it's not that. So it's not just like, it's not like just quitting a job or changing a vocation. It's a hard thing to deal with, to be able to leave that group. The main thing is that people think when you leave the group that all of a sudden you're going to go back to seven times worse than you were. They're yeah, yeah. trying to stigmatize you into thinking you can't leave because once you leave you're turning your back on God and bad things happen to those people. So with that understanding, how do you, having uh, helped so many people, I don't, over 50 members, do you At think? At least, yeah. At least, and then Amy, over, you... Over 20 years. Is there an ingredient where you yes. can take them from denial yeah. yes. to that breakdown that you were speaking of? Um, the main thing is you don't judge them. For example, with Mary, when she was out of the group, we got a call from the train station one night, and it was about 10 o'clock at night, and she asked if Ron and I would go pick her up. And she didn't want to see her brother. She didn't want to see her mother. She said, I just, I have to talk to you. So we came back to our house, and after a little while, Ron went to bed, and Mary and I started talking at midnight. And we talked till 4 o'clock in the morning, and she confessed to me the next morning she said, the whole reason I came to your house was to kill myself. And she said, I, I just felt like I would be more comfortable at your house doing this. And she said, after we talked all night, I realized that I do have hope. She realized she did not want to kill herself and that she did want to live. And we learned that that's what, mostly what she needed was just a, an ear for somebody to listen to. And it was, so it was something to be, you know, joyful for. We need more advocates, you know, like Annika and Ron. If someone is suicidal, you know, somewhere they can go to get the counsel they need. If they need a place and a sort of a sanctuary, even just if it's for a couple weeks to get some resources, to get the help they need. The children of God basically created this problem. They bred all these children within the organization, and they didn't give them the skills to, to survive in the outside world. And that's why people are dying that I know every day of things that can be prevented. Well, hey, everyone. This is Rick. You know, 
rough. I, I used to think a lot about suicide. It's, it actually, believe it or not, it should have started a long time ago. It should have started when I was born, actually. You know, if it had just gotten a little better, a little better, even emotionally, mentally for me, it would have been okay, it would have given me hope. There was a destructive force in all of our lives that we were put through systematically. And we are still dealing with the effects of our upbringing. Hello. Hey, lady. How are you? Good to see you again. Ooh. So glad you made it. A lot of us who've been at this for a while, um, you know, this struggle, this journey and recovering, we have kind of changed our opinion about what we want because I've seen so many of my peers die trying to get some sort of justice. If you watch the Ricky Rodriguez videos, you can see how intangible it was for him. It's like he couldn't, he couldn't make it make sense that these people could do this and all of us could experience this. And I think we've all hit so many brick walls with it and watched people die over it um, that now all we want is to stop it immediately. Because as survivors, we are a community trying to help each other not die. Stories like ours have been told before. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to not only make this a story about what happened to us, mm -hmm. but what didn't happen to us. Yeah. We didn't have that education. We didn't have that community. We didn't have that family backing. We didn't have a way to get a job. You know, and all those things combined are what's missing. It's a, that stable foundation. And when that is not there, then you are going to have people taking their lives yeah. because there's nothing to stand on. You know, we can point to the sexual abuse and we can point to the physical abuse and say, you know, we were abused. And our younger siblings tend to struggle with that right. uh, because they didn't have the group sex, you know, and the, and the, the type of stuff that we dealt with. Yeah, they supposedly abolished uh, adult with child sex. So it's not orchestrated like it was before. It, it's kind of like ripping the policies out but continuing them, right? Right. Because that's what they did, they burned the books. They send out this secret letter that says, well, <laughs> we're only doing that because the system says to, but we actually still believe it. We all know that it can, the abuse has continued to happen. Not blatantly, there were no longer sharing rooms, there were no longer pu public orgies, but the abuse was still going because the people were still there. What I experienced was a lot of uh, dealing with men's advances, older men's advances. And this was when these policies were out, supposedly, and these publications had been burned. I was 12, and he was in his 20s where he would, he would kiss me and he would touch me. What I went through was that they made us have naked communion. 
because they were like, we want you to understand the spirit of the family of love. And so in front of a group of peers, we had to strip naked. And what they told me was that if I would just allow myself to admit that I enjoyed it, I would be able to get over it. So there's still that philosophy in place and at play. Because it's still hurting people. It's still producing the same results. I'm still watching my younger siblings walk out, you know, a year ago, two years ago, you know, and still trying to assimilate in the world just like I did, having the same issues that I did, because morality was turned on its head for all of us. What she's describing, this kind of sexual abuse of children so rampant and open mm -hmm. and it's written down in pamphlets yeah. and teachings how did this go on so, for so many years how did this go on so, for so many years well probably it went on in part because people did not see it as sexual abuse uh, they saw it as variations of transmitting God's love. And uh, nobody on the outside knew this was going on. Well, people knew, but it was hard to reach into the group and stop it. Many of us have spent countless hours informing the FBI on the specific abusers, their names, last known locations. But it's very difficult for the arm of justice to reach across borders as well. So we need to understand that is a factor. I, it just, it, to me, it's mind-boggling. When it? you read what he's preaching, mm -hmm. how on earth is that not leading to a federal raid? And there were a lot of raids in, in various countries. Yeah, they and did, arrests. They did have raids, yes. But nobody ever got convicted. Mary was one of the first people to speak out publicly. Yes, she was. It must have been especially powerful for her to be speaking out, given the fact that she was the granddaughter of the leader. Everyone knew that she was there, that she was, uh, Berg's granddaughter, so her statement made a big impact. It carried a lot of weight. And the fact that she was willing to stand up against her grandfather gave a lot of us the courage to do so later on. And you did. And I did. Nobody can understand what we went through. But I can say one thing is, no matter what, she always had a smile on her face, you know? I just remember her being an icon of uh, standing up to Berg. She literally went through the worst of what there was to experience in the, in the cult. But no matter what, they could never kill her light, her soul. It carried through everything, you know? And I, I think that's the most beautiful thing about her. I don't want to let this be the end of her legacy. So in light of this, this is our chance to, to talk about what, what we want to see happen and what we want to do to help people leaving the cult. This isn't a cult survivor escaping issue. It's women's issues, it's children's issues, it's human Correct. trafficking, yes. it's issues mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are the focus of pro bono programs like that. So if someone is looking for a pro bono lawyer, please let me know. Awesome. And we'd love to give them a, a job in our business if they want to start off. We can actually create a group that's solely for resources. I mean, it all adds up. And then before we know it, I think we're going to find that others are going to want to help because we're actually doing the work. And let's not stop the conversation. Opening a dialogue not about our past and not about the bad things that happened to us, but opening a dialogue about where we're going and what our needs are. I think is gonna change the type of support that we can give to each other. Okay. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna circulate this list between everyone who's on the list. Okay. You know, so that we can just like start right away. A lot of lives were lost. It's impossible to say if our idea could have saved anybody. But we can't not try. We can just help kind of offer a cushion so that they can get back up and turn around and do the same for others. I think that's how it works. I have to admit, until I worked on this series, I had no idea. It was the sexualization of children was so rampant and condoned. 
within this group. Do you think anything's changed, Amy? I have to admit, until I worked on this series, I had no idea. It was the sexualization of children was so rampant and condoned and encouraged and required within this group. Do you think anything's changed, Amy? I think a lot of people that are still affiliated with some of their offshoots, I don't think that they understand the background of the people running them and that many of these people were involved in pedophilia directly. Right, because David Berg is now dead. His second wife is now leading yes. Children of God. Yes. By another name, the Family International. The abusers, the leaders, and a lot of the members are still in the family structure. Wow. Mary must have had a lot of courage. She did. It's... She's a hero to many of us. Like, she just had so many people that loved her, not only from the cult, but people that she influenced after in her fight, uh, you know, dealing with her mental illness. And she donated her time to just go out and help people and give friendship and, you know, whatever she could do, she, she did it. And for my age to have to have so many peers that have passed in uh, those very sad circumstances, it's, it's distressing, it's sad, you know. But um, one thing that it does for me is it, it makes me want to be more resolute in speaking out, in carrying on the work mm -hmm. to help my peers, not only my peers, but just to reach out and be a support network for people that need it, you know, because we understand. That's, that's one of the ways that I try to find a reason, you know, like bring some kind of uh, justice in my own life is just to help people. Sure. And sometimes that's all you can do. That's why I, I keep speaking about my experiences. That's why, you know, I talk to journalists and hope that, you know, something can be done to help Some people may question why there aren't more people willing to speak out about their experiences with the cult or sexual abuse. And I think that one of the reasons is because of the sensationalism that is attached to these stories. We need to remove the stigma. You don't have to be ashamed. If things happen to you, you can, you can talk about it. You can find help. You can find people that are compassionate. I think everybody needs to look around them and say, how can we help people succeed? They just need a little helping hand.